Our children spend six hours a day in a classroom, Monday to Friday, during the school year, of course, for 13 years of their K-12 school life. That's over 14,000 hours. And for those who continue on to college, they will add more to that cumulative total. In the age of Google, we receive so much information on a daily basis. It's equal to about 174 newspapers. Others have reported that we have created more data in the past few years than the entire history of the human race. So much has changed in our world, but has the basic structure for education? Nowadays, is the truth only held in the mind of the educator who has to stand at the front of the classroom and lecture and disperse his knowledge? Why do our classrooms still resemble those from the early 1900s? Here is a picture, this is courtesy of Purdue University, that's circa 1907 from their School of Pharmacy. So if you look at it, you can see desks and chairs and there's blackboards. And actually, I was surprised to learn that they have projection technology. That's called the Magic Lantern, 1907. Let's fast forward 110 years to a sample classroom some of you may recognize this. We have desks and chairs, and whiteboards have replaced those blackboards, but you still see them lined up, lectern at the front, and classic projection technology. I contend that the way we think about classrooms is wrong, that not much has changed in the past 100 years. In fact, if we ignored other spaces as much as we ignore classrooms, other spaces that we spend a lot of time in, we'd still be driving cars that look like this. University space, university space. Nearly 40% of all of our current space was constructed over 50 years ago. In higher education, we think of space more as part of a campus master planning project than an integral part of teaching and learning. In fact, don't get me started on the large lecture halls, right? It's, they're bigger than this room, right? I just read an article a couple of weeks ago. It talked about a lecture hall that had 300 seats in it, and on the roster were 800 students. I'm the proud mother of a high school senior, and that affords me the opportunity to actually visit other universities. And we go on the tours, and we see their beautiful, innovative cafeterias, and their new student lounge spaces, and the dorms. And yes, I am that mom that says, um, excuse me, tour guide, but can I see a classroom? And sometimes they're actually part of the tour, many times they're not, and sometimes they oblige me, and I'll sneak in if they don't. But I am always under-impressed. You have the same classroom lineup. We got the desks, the chairs, you get the lectern at the front and projection technology. I need to pause now though, and I have to give a shout out to the media centers and the maker spaces that are appearing in our educational environment. They have made great advances, so I really have to acknowledge them. But from what I've seen so far, they're viewed as ancillary space. They're not really part of the fabric of the school, the unit of the school, the class session. What if we designed a space that didn't look like a classroom at all, that had funky furniture and all whiteboard walls? Right? There have been studies done on space, and those studies that view campus space as part of this master planning project, they look at outcomes such as utilization and occupancy rates, not learning. But then there's other studies that have been done on active learning, and they actually reconfigure the desks and chairs and have students working in groups. And those studies have shown that it positively impacts learning. But in those studies, not only do they change the space, but they also change the pedagogical approach. That's the way we teach, right? So they also change the pedagogical approach there really has not been much evidence on the impact of space itself on learning until now.
So here at Centenary University, we conducted an experiment. 10 professors, 105 students, some of those wonderful professors are sitting here in the audience now, agreed to take part in this. And they said, yes, we'll look and examine our learning in our current classroom versus an innovative new space called the Innovation Cave and determine if they learned more. Now, we took different course types, ranging from statistics and accounting to actual film production and theater appreciation. And the results were amazing. For those of you in research, we say significant. And the students reported an increase in learning in the innovation cave. And when you look at those variables, that's not just any type of learning. That's evaluating a point of view, forming a new idea, analyzing, applying. These are higher order learning items. And they perceived an increase in the innovation cave. Another great insight from this experiment was we asked a really good question, a question that really helped separate out the message. And that question was, how much do you like this classroom setting? And we asked it of their current classroom and also the innovation cave. And the students said, yeah, we like the innovation cave a bit more, but not significantly more. So think about the message. The students are telling us, yeah, we like the setting a bit more, but we learned a lot more. That's very powerful. So what happened? We didn't tell the professors, we didn't give them a protocol to change the way they teach as part of the experiment, but the professors reported that they did change the way they teach. They changed their teaching style to a more interactive approach because of the space itself. And they also reported, and this was so interesting, that in the innovation cave, they had an increased understanding of students' issues with concepts. So an increased understanding of students' issues with concepts. So you may look at that and say, Kathy, that just looks like a bunch of writable walls. The little thing can make a huge difference. So in this case, the whiteboard is six inches from them. Maybe some of you remember this. I hope I'm not alone, but I remember being in grammar school. And they'd be like, Kathleen, come to the front of the class and show the class about that on the blackboard. And you make that long walk up 15 feet, right? And you have all those eyes staring at the back of your head, right? So now think about this shift. It's right there. The students can share. What's normally invisible in the students' minds becomes visible. And then students can connect with one another and have the collective intelligence of the group. And professors can connect ideas. And not only that, professors, back to that insight we had, professors can see if the group is not understanding a concept and correct it early on. One student told me, this is the qualitative part of it, said going into the innovation cave, they were sitting there saying, looking at each other like, what are we gonna do in here? And then they walked out saying that it was the session where they learned the most that semester. Another student reported that with its funky furniture, all at the same level, everyone's at the same level, even the professor, and there's no front of the classroom, that those students that are always very vocal, kind of in their current classroom, you know what I'm talking about, right, sitting up front, those students who are very vocal, actually in the innovation cave, there was more of a balance of share of voice more equal participation. That was very powerful feedback coming from a student. As we move forward, an augmented reality and virtual reality will enter into the way we teach and learn. Maybe classrooms won't even be defined by four walls anymore. But until we get there, until that time, I challenge you all with this. Instead of creating innovative, new cafeterias and student lounge spaces. Let's bring innovation into the classroom or bring learning into those spaces so that we can educate our students in spaces that keep pace with the cars we drive and the homes we live in. Thank you.